I think part of the reason I like masks, in, in addition to the whole like common decency thing, you know, caring about other humans, is my face seems a lot more appealing when you see less of it. Sup, you beautiful bastards! Hope you've had a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, otherwise I will punch you in the throat, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today, you know, I know tonight is the first presidential debate. There are just 34 days until election day, but I do really wanna hit on the fact that the election has actually already started. According to a report from NPR yesterday, almost a million ballots have already been cast. And I'll start updating this list as more states are added. Right now, if you live in Wyoming, South Dakota, Minnesota, Michigan, parts of Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, Vermont, or Illinois, you can actually go vote in person today in what many of these states call in-person absentee voting. Right, if you're someone that's concerned that your vote might accidentally get invalidated because of the mail, or you're concerned about all the doubt that's been cast from, let's say, President Trump or whoever, you can vote in person today, obviously be as safe as possible. But yeah, know that that is available to you right now. Then, as far as mail-in voting, if you live in North Carolina, Kentucky, Arkansas, West Virginia, Alabama, Louisiana, Tennessee, Texas, or Virginia, and you were approved for a mail-in or absentee ballot, they have been mailed out to you. And if you do want one, you can request a ballot and hope to get approved, but note that all of these states have rules about who qualifies and doesn't. Also, if you live in Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, Delaware, Georgia, Idaho, Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Missouri, North Dakota, or Nebraska, those states have also sent mail-in ballots to those who requested them. However, in these states, you can still request to get them and anyone who wants one is eligible. You don't need an excuse. And finally, all voters in Michigan, New Jersey, Oregon, Rhode Island, Vermont, Illinois, and Maryland should receive mail-in ballots automatically, so keep an eye out for them. Also, if you didn't see your state listed, do not worry. In the upcoming days and weeks, we'll see more states joining these. Now, obviously, all of that very pertinent information for the registered voter. Which, on that note, if you are a professional procrastinator like myself in many avenues, but for you, if you are a voting age and you are not registered, it is still not too late. But the deadlines for your state are just around the corner. So if you want to be that change that you see in the world, you want to be a part of this process, go to vote.org. It has fantastic resources and it can also help you get registered there. And I mean this most urgently, starting with South Carolina. You can either go in person to register or you can mail in a registration. That needs to be sent and dated before Friday. You can also register online and that deadline is actually coming up this Sunday. But to that, I say, why then if you can do it now? Also, speaking of this Sunday, that is the last day that you can register if you live in Alaska, Louisiana, Mississippi, or Rhode Island. And in all those places except Mississippi, you can register online. And actually, if you're in Louisiana, you have until October 21st to register online. And of course, with this story and anytime we talk about voting, I'm gonna link to a ton of resources down below if you need any help whatsoever. You know, obviously because of this year, but not not just because of this year, it's a big deal to me. Part of the reason I created this show, I started talking about the news in my early 20s is, as a young person, I didn't have a lot of people to talk about the news with. Not a ton of people were engaged, and so I kind of sought out looking for my people. You know, one of the reasons I hit so hard on go register to vote, go vote, is because you could be a part of a huge change. You know, there's always conversations about how few people vote in America compared to the whole adult population. But in addition to that, the United States has one of the lowest rates of youth voter turnout in the world. And you know, there I'm talking about 18 to 29, I'm gonna expand that to 18 to 35 to fit more of my, almost my entire audience. And I'm not gonna shit on you if prior to this moment you were like, I'm never gonna vote. It is very easy to look around in this country and be disillusioned and feel hopeless. My best-selling clothing literally has the words emotionally exhausted on it. I get it, but that doesn't mean give up. But also, I will say this year, it will be interesting to see if we do see an uptick. The stakes are the highest they've been, at least in my lifetime. It feels less impossible for more people to avoid what's happening. And I think it's why you're seeing people like, even he would call himself one of the last people you would imagine would say this. You have people like Tyler, the creator, trying to get the youth vote out. Please, please, if you are young and your back don't hurt, go to them polls and cast a vote. And I didn't give a fuck about none of this shit, just like a lot of y'all. This is actually going to be my first time voting, but I am on the other. I see the light. And a lot of y'all going to be like, eh, my vote doesn't matter. And they're going to pick who they want. Yeah, I, you weird. Keep that up. Y'all was posting black squares and, and, and protesting from y'all phone and, and writes this and canceling everybody. Pull up. Y'all want a new DA? Pull up. Y'all y'all want all these rights and pull up. Yeah, I guess the final thing I would say here is never doubt the power of your vote. There is so much money and so much effort put into this campaign, not only to get you to vote for the other person, but also to get you or groups of certain people not to vote. And they do that not because it's funsies, but because you do have power. But yeah, 
That's where I'll leave that. Then, let's talk about a story that is the source of my favorite headline of the day. YouTube celebrates Deaf Awareness Week by killing crowdsourced captions. Yeah, yikes. So if you're unaware, YouTube has had a feature called Community Contributions. And once enabled on a channel, viewers could provide captions for the video to, you know, help other people. You know, something that was helpful for the deaf community as well as translations or even just captions in other languages. Something that was especially helpful considering the alternative was YouTube's automatic captions, which are often wrong. So much so that for a little while, we saw a trend of people recreating videos they uploaded, but only using the captions that were auto-generated. Now, as far as why YouTube made this decision, they provided an answer, but then also seemingly contradicted it, writing in their announcement, while we hope community contributions would be a wide-scale, community-driven source of quality translations for creators, it's rarely used and people continue to report spam and abuse. But then, they also say, we know many of you rely on community captions, and thanks to the feedback we receive, YouTube will be covering the cost of a six-month subscription of Amara.org for all creators who have used the community contribution feature for at least three videos in the last 60 days. Right, so you had people pointing to those two statements going, isn't that a conflicting argument? With the number of those people very likely having already signed a massive change.org petition. As of recording this video, over 512,000 people have signed a petition calling for YouTube to not remove community captions. Though, petition aside, it does not appear that YouTube will be reversing course here. A decision that has inspired comments like, quote, we at YouTube understand what it's like to be deaf because no matter how much you protest, we can't hear you. Now I will say, personally, I am torn on this issue. As YouTube has pointed out, the feature is rarely used with less than 0.00 1% of channels having published community captions, showing on less than 0.2% of watch time in the last month. Right, so that is heavily underused, but with a site as big as YouTube, 0.2% is still a massive number of people, which I think is why we saw so many people sign the petition. And so with that, I'm inclined to think that YouTube actually found a decent middle ground in offering channels and communities that have been using this feature, a free subscription to a service that will allow them to continue it. Though YouTube's decision to kind of offload this on a third party, it, it doesn't feel great. But I guess kind of where I'll leave this story is if you are a content creator, I highly recommend you use a third-party transcription caption service. You may not be aware if you get to my videos super fast, but we've actually provided captions for a very long time. We use a service called Rev. It takes a little time because the transcription starts after we upload to YouTube. But like yesterday's video, for example, it's 15 minutes. It has captions for English and Spanish. It costs $45, which for a channel of my size is not prohibitive, but you know, if you're a much smaller channel, it would be. But yeah, I think if you are a large creator, there's, there's no excuse for your videos not to be captioned. But yeah, with this whole story in general, I would love to know your thoughts. Is YouTube completely in the wrong here? Does it make sense for them as a business? Any and all thoughts and opinions, I'd love to know. Then let's talk about sports and COVID. You know, we've seen sports coming back, the NBA with the bubble in Florida. Baseball came back. We saw that outbreak with the Marlins. And of course we have the NFL, which just finished its third week of the season. And boom, the headline, Titans have NFL's first COVID-19 outbreak with eight positives. According to the NFL, this involves three Titans players, five personnel. The NFL also saying in a statement that the Tennessee Titans and Minnesota Vikings, which was the last team that they played, they've suspended in-person activities following these results. The NFL adding both clubs are working closely with the NFL and the NFLPA, including our infectious disease experts to evaluate close contacts, perform additional testing and monitor development. Though the potential silver lining here is that this might not be widespread. With the Vikings releasing a statement saying they had not received any positive results from their testing after Sunday's game. This is gonna be an interesting one to watch because this is really the NFL's first big test. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Omaze. If you didn't know, Omaze is a fundraising platform that gives you the chance to win once in a lifetime experiences and awesome prizes, all while raising money for nonprofit organizations. And we have partnered with Omaze to give you beautiful bastards a chance to win a Tesla Model X Performance, customized with special upgrades by the world-class team at Unplugged Performance. And the upgrades are awesome, including 22-inch black wheels, carbon fiber spoiler, a matte white exterior wrap with red leather accents. And if that weren't enough, taxes and shipping are included, and Omaze will also hook you up with $20,000 on top of all of that. Also, your entry isn't just a chance to win, it is a donation to the Juju Foundation, an organization that, yes, was founded by Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver Juju Smith-Schuster. It's dedicated to support of youth programs and initiatives to lift the spirits of those in need. And so it's a win-win. You get a chance to win a dream car while supporting underserved youth around the country. And so to enter, just go to omaze.com slash fill or click that link in the description down below for your chance to win and to support a great call. And the first bit of awesome, to be clear, not a sponsor. Just a big fan of when you see kind of organically grown talent kind of busting into the business world. Right, whether it be a Dobrik trying to launch a social media app, Ela Klein with Teddy Fresh, uh, 100 Thieves, like what, what's happened there is awesome. And this week, while I am probably in no way her demo, seeing what massive YouTuber Emma Chamberlain did with her 
coffee company is, is, is impressive. Her initial launch a little while ago, it seemed kind of like a, maybe a one-off cash grab, but she just did a massive rebrand, a relaunch, and it, it looks amazing. Personally, I'm excited to see one, where this brand is in one to three years, but also what other big, massive companies online creators may make, especially consumer focused, in the future. We had Gus Johnson giving us why is Twitter video so bad? For some reason, Guinness World Records gave us most walnuts crushed with the head in one minute. Sure, live your best life. We had Jessica Alba on Stir Crazy with Josh Horowitz. We got the official trailer for Marvel's 616. If you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about these massive updates to the Breonna Taylor story and specifically the updates around the grand jury ruling from last week. Right, so Breonna Taylor was of course that 26 year old EMT who was shot and killed in her own apartment in what's been largely described as a botched drug raid. Louisville police were serving a warrant because they believed an ex-boyfriend of Brianna's was using her apartment to receive packages. Notably, both Taylor and her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, didn't have any prior drug arrests or convictions and no drugs were found in the apartment. While serving the warrant, police say they knocked, they identified themselves before entering, but Walker as well as Brianna's family and multiple neighbors have claimed they did not. And so because of that, Walker said that he thought that they were an ex or an intruder. So when police entered by force, he fired a weapon, hitting one of the officers in the leg. The officers respond by unloading into the apartment, hitting Brianna, killing her. One of the officers, Detective Brett Hankison, blindly fires into the apartment, which also traveled into neighboring apartments. And where we last left this story last week was with Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron announcing that none of the three officers involved in Brianna's death were charged for her actual killing. With him saying that the grand jury overseeing the case decided not to charge two of the officers at all, that being Jonathan Mattingly and Miles Cosgrove. With Cameron also adding that the FBI found that the bullet that actually killed Brianna Taylor came from Cosgrove, and noting that the only person that actually got charged in this was Hankison, who was charged with three counts of wanton endangerment. Though, notably here, those charges are not connected to the death of Breonna Taylor, but rather because he shot so recklessly, resulting in shots going into a neighboring apartment. In response to this announcement, we saw Breonna's family, their lawyers, and many others strongly condemn Cameron, saying they didn't believe that he advocated on behalf of Breonna at all, and calling for more transparency and information as to how Cameron presented the case to the jury. There, we saw Cameron refuse to release any grand jury transcripts or recordings, arguing that it could interfere with other ongoing investigations. And that right there is very very significant because of two major updates. The first is that an anonymous juror on the Breonna Taylor case filed a complaint in court requesting that all recordings and transcripts from the jury deliberations be released and to make it so the jurors on the case can be permitted to speak about it publicly. This because the juror claims that Cameron actually misrepresented the jury's discussions and saying that Cameron never actually offered them the option to bring homicide charges against the officers who killed her. Now, very notably here, that complaint flagged several remarks that Cameron made during his announcement. In his remarks, Cameron noted that many people would be unhappy with the decision, but emphasized that his role was to pursue the truth, present all the facts to the grand jury, and let them decide, adding, While there are six possible homicide charges under Kentucky law, these charges are not applicable to the facts before us because our investigation showed and the grand jury agreed that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in their return of deadly fire after having been fired upon. And regarding the investigation's findings, Cameron also said that the officer's claim that they knocked and announced themselves was backed up by an independent witness. And there, when a reporter asked why the testimony from just one witness was so credible, especially because out of a dozen witnesses they had spoken to, only one said that they heard the police knock, Cameron responded, I think the more pertinent question is what was the uh, evidence provided to the grand jury? What was sufficient for their purposes? Uh, they got to hear and listen to all the testimony uh, and made the determination uh, that uh Detective Hankinson was the one that needed to be indicted. And really notably here, when asked if he ever presented manslaughter or homicide charges to be considered by the jury, Cameron said, I won't get uh, into the specifics again of the, the proceedings themselves are, are secret, but what I will say is that uh, our, our team walked them through every uh, homicide offense uh, and also presented all of the information uh, that was available uh, to the grand jury, and then the grand jury was ultimately the one that made the decision about uh, indicting uh, Detective Hankinson uh, for wanton endangerment. But in the complaint, we see the juror accuse Cameron of using the jury as a shield to deflect accountability and responsibility, and adding that in Cameron's public remarks about the decisions the jury made, he further laid those decisions at the feet of the grand jury while failing to answer specific questions regarding the charges presented. And continuing that Cameron attempted to make it very clear that the grand jury alone made the decision on who and what to charge, and thus were the ones who decided not to bring homicide charges, when in reality, he was the one who never gave them that option in the first place, with the complaint going on to say. The only exception to the responsibility he foisted upon the grand jurors was 
in his statement that they agreed with his team's investigation that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in their actions. The juror then goes on to argue that it is in the public interest to release the record specifically because so many citizens have shown a lack of faith in the legal proceedings and the justice system itself, saying the public interest spreads across the entire Commonwealth when the highest law enforcement official fails to answer questions and instead refers to the grand jury making the decisions, with them later adding, it is patently unjust for the jurors to be subjected to the level of accountability the attorney general campaigned for simply because they received a summons to serve their community. And with all of that said, like I mentioned at the top, this is not the only news that we got yesterday regarding the release of records. During an arraignment hearing for Brett Henkison, where he pled not guilty to all charges, we saw the judge overseeing the case, ordering a recording of the grand jury proceedings to be added to the court file by noon tomorrow. Last night, we saw Cameron announcing that he would follow the judge's orders, release the recordings, with him reiterating the statement that he believed the grand jury was meant to be secretive, and that releasing the records would compromise the ongoing federal investigation and it could have unintended consequences, such as poisoning the jury pool, but adding, despite those concerns, that they would comply with the judge's order. Also noting the release would address the legal complaint filed by that anonymous juror, also saying he didn't have concerns about jurors speaking to the public, and adding, once the public listens to the recording, they will see that over the course of two and a half days, our team presented a thorough and complete case to the grand jury. Though very notably, in that statement, he also confirmed for the first time that he never asked the jury to consider homicide or manslaughter charges. So now, with this story that we continue to see developments, we wait. You know, while with some of this, it will reveal information about what was presented to the jurors, you still have a lot of questions about what happened that night and how the investigation was handled from the get-go, especially because over the weekend, Vice News reported that it obtained previously unseen video from body camera footage of officers and SWAT team members who showed up after the shooting, with Vice reporting that that footage, taken by 45 different cameras and included in the investigative file shared with the AG's office, shows officers appearing to break multiple department policies and corroborates parts of Taylor's boyfriend's testimony, adding that it also raises questions about the integrity of not only the crime scene, but also the ensuing investigation into what happened that night. The report goes on to give examples of policy violations, like the fact that none of the officers who were present for the raid were separated and paired with an escort. It also says that the footage shows Hankison returning to the active crime scene and even stepping inside the apartment. After he's asked to leave by the SWAT team, he's allegedly seen walking up to a SWAT team member on the sidewalk and asking if his body camera is on before the video cuts out. The report also said one of the other officers present during the raid violated protocols by interviewing witnesses. And in regards to the parts of Walker's testimony the video backs up, Vice reports that the footage shows officers threatening to send a narcotics dog to attack him, and when he asked what he did, Hankison told him, you're going to prison. That's what's going on. For the rest of your life, with Walker's lawyer addressing the new footage in a statement to Vice saying, it's all just further evidence of a cover-up to violate their own policies and allow suspects involved in the shooting to have access to the crime scene and interview witnesses. There were some professional officers who attempted to secure the scene and protect the integrity of the investigation, but unfortunately, they arrived too late. Yeah, that is essentially where we are now, and of course, with this story, I would love to know your thoughts. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of my daily dives into the news. Also, if you're new here, definitely hit that subscribe button, join the family, maybe even text me at 813-213-4423. Get notifications, behind the scenes, other cool stuff. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.